the talk really is in two pieces. Uh, as you know, you've read probably in the newspapers, we've recently received a, a donation from the DuPont Company of uh, $3,500 to fund the display which will go in the little room right here at the corner. We're going to put in there a, a display of the early days, the coming of the Savannah River plant. And the American Nuclear Society is helping with the design of that display. Now, unfortunately, we won't have it in by Saturday night, but uh, it is coming. On that basis, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the history of DuPont in terms of how the company got started and how it got into the atomic energy business, a little bit about the coming of the Savannah River plant, and then because it's, it's been in the newspapers a great deal recently and because I had some slides which had already been cleared by DOE for an off-plant presentation, uh, I'll talk a little bit about El Reactor, and this will give me a chance to show you some pictures of the way the plant is today. Again, I'm not on tape, so feel free to, to chime in at any time, okay? I'm going to catch that light. <coughs> okay, I, I, I call this presentation uh, DuPont and Atomic Energy from Brandywine Creek to Steel Creek. Brandywine Creek being the, the origin of the DuPont uh, powder mills, the first location of the powder mills uh, near Wilmington, Delaware, and Steel Creek being the controversial effluent from El Reactor. So uh, I'll try to cover uh, a couple hundred years of history in contrast with my last talk where I tried to cover 12,000. <laughs> to begin with, DuPont uh, was founded, uh, the founder of DuPont was a, a young man named Yuthuri Irene DuPont Dina Moores, uh, here and after known as E.I. because it's a lot easier. Uh, young E.I. was the son of a, a French aristocrat. He was a bright boy. He studied under Antoine Lavoisier in France, who at, who at that time was the probably the leading chemist uh, in Europe, and Lavoisier also at that time had the contract to make gunpowder for the French government. So uh, young DuPont studied under the man who probably knew more about the black powder business than anybody else in the world. Now his father was a rather outspoken individual, had a publishing business, got crosswise with the French uh, Revolution. And it got to the point where it was either uh, leave the country or uh, go to the guillotine. Uh, his father took the appropriate action, and 12 of them, 12 members of the DuPont family, came to the U.S. in 1799. Their idea was that they were going to found a French-speaking community in this new land. And they got here and they discovered that there were already French-speaking communities and German-speaking communities and Italians and practically every conceivable ethnic group was already here. There really wasn't any big demand for another ethnic community. However, there was a large demand for good quality gunpowder. So uh, EI, in 1802, borrowed $36,000 to capitalize a new company which was to make high-quality gunpowder. And uh, he told the bankers from whom he borrowed this money that there were uh, good chances that in a few years this new company could turn a profit of as much as $10,000 a year. And uh, he, he uh, rather exceeded that, that goal. He established the first mills on the Brandywine Creek near Wilmington, Delaware, and sold his first powder in 1804. This is an artist's conception of those early mills on the Brandywine. This is the, the creek here in the foreground. Here you see the stone mill buildings in which the powder was ground and mixed using water power from the creek. Uh, these buildings were designed such that if there was an explosion inside one of these buildings, which was not a, a, an unusual occurrence, uh, the stone walls would prevent the explosion from propagating to the next building and the lightweight wooden roof would blow out into the creek, thereby preserving the, 
the warehouses, storehouses uh, in the background, and also the homes of the workers and the managers who lived up on the hill overlooking the Brandywine. Oh, there's one that didn't drop. Okay, Let's see if I can get that one again. Powder making was a, an inherently dangerous business, and uh, this is a copy of in hand handwritten copy of the rules for running the mills, written by E. I. in 18 January 1st, 1811. And uh, I thought they were pretty interesting rules. I know you can't read them. This is a typed version of the same thing here. Uh, but I'd like, I'd like to tell you what they say. It says, number one, said they will always keep the greatest regularity in the works. And that means housekeeping. You know, you don't fall over things. And, and it's, it's kind of interesting because today, a uh, hundred and uh, seventy some years later, uh, all of the DuPont safety rules start with emphasis on housekeeping. Number two says all kind of play or disorderly fun is prohibited. <laughs> you had a little trouble with English uh, verbs, but uh, but you get the message. No horseplay, you know. Number three, no kind of spiritous liquors is allowed to be fetched and drink in the factory. <laughs> Again, you know. It's pretty standard kind of safety rule. Number four is the service manual in, in one statement. Does any of the men that will wish to absent himself will ask the leave of Mr. Dalmas or Mr. Dupont? <laughs> you can't be on the job, tell your boss. But, you know, these are all pretty standard rules. And the interesting thing is that back in 1811, Dupont drew them up for this first powder mill on the Brandywine and that they have formed the basis of DuPont's corporate safety position through time. Now, how effective are these rules and the others that have been drawn up through the years? Well, uh, I'd like to, sh I, I, this slide I think pretty well shows it. This is in terms of lost workday cases per 200,000 hours of exposure. This means if you hurt one person so badly that he can't come to work, every 200,000 hours, then, you know, you get a one here. And this shows the, the last 30 years of injury performance. All U.S. industry in green, the U.S. chemical industry in blue, the DuPont company in white, and Savannah River Plant and Savannah River Laboratory in red. And I think you can see that DuPont is doing something right in taking actions which prevent people from getting hurt. <laughs> now, DuPont's a big company, 134,000 employees, 140 sites, 29 states, more than 1,700 products and product lines. That doesn't, in, that doesn't include every color of Lucite paint, but the Lucite paint is one product line. Sales, 33 billion roughly, and, and $24 billion investment. It's big. Now, how did, it, how did it get into the Savannah River plant, and how did it get into the, the atomic energy business? DuPont's a high technology company. It makes its money traditionally by coming up with a new product, inventing a new product, and beating the competition into the marketplace with it. DuPont makes its money on products like nylon. That's the, the major one. Lucite. Teflon. It makes money by, by doing the research and development and then getting the new product into the marketplace quickly before the, the competition can get there. To do that, it has its own construction force, its own engineering force, as well as its operating people. Because it had these resources, which, was, which were unique within the company, DuPont was asked by the Manhattan Project in World War II to participate in the development of the atomic energy program. This is a, a picture of the first atomic pile. Uh, it was called a pile because it was made of blocks of graphite, which uh, went critical under the 
Stagg Field, which is the football stadium at the University of Chicago, on December 2nd, 1942. This was uh, the first self-sustaining nuclear reaction anywhere in the world. And it's interesting that in this very small group, uh, and the Manhattan Project had pulled out the top brains in the country under the, the direction of Dr. Enrico Fermi uh, to uh, mastermind this project. In this very small group, there were two DuPonters. The tall gentleman standing here is uh, Crawford Greenwald, uh, who went on to become president of DuPont from 1948 to 1962. He also wrote the definitive book on hummingbirds. <laughs> For any of you, he was one of those Renaissance people. Any of you who want to see beautiful photographs and, and learn all you want to have ever wanted to know about hummingbirds, read the Greenwall book. The other gentleman doesn't show up as well, hunched here over the uh, the uh, very elaborate control console for the for the reactor was Bill Overbeck. Bill is familiar to many of you. Uh, he was one of the pioneers in the nuclear business, came down here to become uh, director of the Savannah River Laboratory from 1961 to 1967. So DuPont was, was present and active in the very earliest days of the atomic energy business. When it became likely that the, the country could build an atomic weapon to bring the war with Japan to, a, to an early end, DuPont was asked to do that. DuPont was asked to design, build, and operate the Hanford Atomic Project, which for a long time was called TNX because uh, uh, the letters had no relation to anything else, but uh, it was very highly classified, employed 45,000 workers at peak, and DuPont designed, built, and operated this facility uh, during the time period 1942 through 1944 and in 1945 of course the World War II was concluded with the dropping of the two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. At that point uh, DuPont asked to be relieved from its contract to operate Hanford since uh, everybody knew that the you know we had won the war and there were going to be no more need for nuclear weapons and DuPont was anxious to get its people back into the commercial business. In 1946, uh, DuPont uh, was relieved of its contract and turned the plant over to General Electric. Uh, I should point out that DuPont, on both the Hanford Project and the Savannah River plant, make, has made no profit. The terms of the contract were that DuPont got one dollar for the course of the contract period. So for running Hanford in 1946, uh, they got their dollar. For the work at the Savannah River plant, they have yet to receive the buck. In 1950, Harry Truman wrote to DuPont, letter to Mr. Greenwald. <coughs> this was right after the Soviets had tested their first atomic bomb and asked DuPont to get back into the business to design, construct, and operate certain new facilities for the atomic energy program. Crawford Greenwald responded to this on the, on the same basis that uh, the, the uh, company responded to, to the request of, to, for uh, design, construction, and operation of Hanford, fixed fee of $1 in the public interest. That began a, a huge search for a site for the plant. There were 114 candidate sites developed and it turned out that the one near Aiken uh, was selected as shown in this uh, November 1950 uh, Columbia newspaper headline. 